I'll bet you never heard this expression. Probably never thought of it this way. But did you know that there are some things that are too stupid to be true and too obvious to be false? The reason you never heard that is because I wrote it. <laughs> In Bible read, that's the way we look at it sometimes. We look at reading the Bible as too stupid to be true, but then too obvious to be false. Because the reality of looking at our word, the word of God that is, to be looking at our Bible is that we must be too stupid for it to be true because it's so simple to read that all we need to do is read it. All we need to do is listen to what it says for itself. Really, all we need to do is to apply it as it says to do it rather than what we say to do. Because you see, one of the things that we find out in reading the Bible, in Bible read, is that we're rather simple people. We don't pay much attention to what we're reading. We don't have much comprehension of the fact that the Word of God, as declared in the Word of God, decides for itself, speaks for itself, defines itself, and is the reality of itself as being Jesus personified in the Word itself as being the physical representation of God himself, which is the fulfillment of the word spoken that has said that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God, which is literally Jesus himself, for life is in the Son, and he who has the Son has life, he who is not the Son of God has not life. So, we are complex in the simplicity, and the simplicity has the complexity of the reality of God in it. So that's why I like to say, hey, don't give me your theology. Don't give me your meology, but give me the ology with which I look at and I read and I see Jesus in the Word of God. Because from volume to volume, from line upon line, from precept upon precept, from the beginning to the end, even beyond this book that we look at, I know that Jesus is contained in the volume thereof because it says so. And what God says so, I know so. And what I know so is what God said so. So any more so than what someone may speak so or may me think so, I don't think so because I know so that God said so and that's also going to be all that we do in this of what we choose to read. Hey, that's why we call it Bible read. It may seem simple to you, but you try repeating that three times. Holy cow! And we're not going... We are not going up on the mountaintop for the cow. No, we're not going there. We're going to stay here in the Word of God. And as we look at the Word of God, we're stuck in Matthew, or I should say we are reading in Matthew, in the book that we call Matityahu in Hebrew, which, you know, you can play with it any way you want to. You can do with what you want. But the point being is that we're looking at this portion of Scripture and reading it just for what it says without having to go into some kind of Greek or Hebrew or look at the back or the present or the future or the reality of something that you might want to extensionally project into some other place and time and purpose. But we're just going to say, hey, this was God speaking, so what we're reading is what he's saying, and what he's saying is what we're hearing, and what we're hearing is what we're going to do. So. Oh God, give us ears to hear and eyes to see what it is that the Spirit of God might lead us. Direct us, as it were, to give us the capability of reflecting on the mirror of the Word that gives us a perspective of ourselves, of the reality of what you're doing with us, of the nature and the knowledge of who you are, and of the revelation of your Son as you make it applicable to our lives personally, uniquely and distinctly, that word spoken fitly for us, like apples of gold and pitchers of silver, that it would be just something we can nourish ourselves on, that we could easily understand, that we can comprehend with our own heart, our mind, our soul, and our strength, that we might see you, O oh God, and know you for who you are, personal and intimate and real, as we see in this word today what you would say for us to understand as we look at and as we see you, Jesus, as you are. So in Matthew 5, 13, Jesus speaking to everyone, because we're told it's a Sermon on the Mount, and some people say it's a sermon to the disciples, and some people say, well, seeing the multitudes, you know, he went up to the mountaintop, said his part, what he was said his disciples came unto him. I've got news for you. You know, unless you read into it, you wouldn't 
cause or make it into something that it's not. You just have to read it and let it speak for itself. So this is what he's saying to everyone. This is what it is because we're reading it. So it's being spoken to us. So as he spoke, he said, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. You, who are you? You, right there, me, right here. You, Jesus speaking, are the salt of the earth. You are. Guess what? You're the salt of the earth. You are that salt that keeps, preserves, makes salty, or in some way affects the earth. I got news for you. Too much salt can destroy the earth. As a matter of fact, it wasn't long before, you know, part of Jerusalem itself was salted or parts of different lands were salted. Or you throw salt into, what, pools, well springs, so that they no longer are fit to be drunk. Too much salt is a bad thing, but the right amount of salt is a good thing. As we see the salt of the earth, we don't see it as being the salt of the ocean. We see it as the salt of the earth. We see it as the preservative, possibly, but we don't know. We only know that we're the salt of the earth. So you may be too much of you and not enough of the preservation of what God is wanting to use you for. So I just see the salt of the earth as salt of the earth. But if the salt has lost its savor, oh, now we get it. The salt, if you're savoring it, that means you're tasting it. Because to savor something means to appreciate it, to treat it as though it were ah, good, because that's what savor means. It means to have flavor in a positive experiential way with which you enjoy the experience of using your taste buds to take them and to have the fragrance, of, as it were, of the tongue, being able to experience the reality of something that's been added to any type of item that's going into the mouth so that the, the nerve endings within your cheeks, within your tongue, within your upper and lower cavity, within your mouth and under your tongue might experience that shock, that spark, that awakening. And it's like, oh, wow, that's salty. Hmm, good. It brings out, enhances, and brings forth the flavor of whatever it's added to. Are you like that? Are you the salt of the earth that something you're added to brings out the flavor of others? Are you something that's to be savored? Are you something to be enjoyed? In the earth, are you someone that is bringing out the flavor of the earth? Are you someone that is bringing out the quality of other people? Are you the salt of the earth? Or, rather, if you have lost your savor, how are you going to get it back if you are salt? Because that's your nature. And once your nature's gone, what's it good for? Oh, I, I can use salt. You know, I want to melt some snow. I know where to use salt. Well, you know, that's where I would probably put it. Because it says, if the salt has lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? How can you put the flavor of salt back into salt? How can you make salt salty? You can't. You can't. And that's a sad truth. What you were meant to be is what you should be. But if you aren't, you need to be made new. Because you can't go back to what you should have been. You need to be recreated into what you can be. God says, if any man be in Christ, he's new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. You could be new. You could be salt. But if you've lost the savor, if you're no longer tasty, if you're no longer <sighs> salty, then wherewith are you going to be salted? How will you be salted? What are you good for? You're only good to be stomped on and romped on, really, to be under the foot of man. And maybe that's where you are. And maybe that's the reason why. It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under the foot of man. Are you good for nothing? I didn't say it. I just read it. Are you good for nothing? Are you cast out? 
Jesus said. There's a design. Make no mistake. There's a purpose for your life. You are of a nature and of a gift that God has placed within you of his nature to do something and to accomplish something. You are the salt of the earth. You are the salt of the earth. You are the salt of the earth. But if you've lost your savor, what are you good for? What are you good for if you're not good for savoring? If you're not good for someone tastes your life and sees that it's good. Someone tastes your words and says, oh, they're inspiring. Someone tastes and sees that you have something that causes a person to want more. That they're thirsty for more of what you've got. Rather than they don't want anything you have to say. For what reason have you been created? What is your purpose in life? If you read today and you are told you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its favor, worth it shall be salted. It is henceforth good for nothing. What are you good for? If you're not good to be savored and you're not the salt of the earth, it's good for nothing but to be cast out. Anytime that you read the word cast out, it's not a good thing. As a matter of fact, every occasion that you see a cast out is condemnation. And that condemnation causes the justification of the reality of what God had said that you were supposed to be. Determine that you did not become what you were meant to be. And so God places you in a faraway place that's cast out as far away from Him as it can be. And that's where sin and hell and Hades and all the fallen angels are going to be cast into the lake of fire. Because they will be cast out. My God, what are you good for? What are you good for? To be trodden under foot of your foot. Jesus wasn't kidding, nor was he a sugar daddy, nor was he friendly to every single person he met. He said tough things, and the reality of him was that people respected the reality of what he said because they knew what he meant. It's not a challenge, it's not hard to understand having a pile of salt in your hand, the salt of the earth, and scooping it up. Hmm, salty. Let's use that on the sprinkle that on some meat. It's not hard to understand when you work in and you live by fishing industry that you need salt in order to preserve the meat, to keep it and allow it to dry out so that you are having food when you can't harvest fish. When you can't throw your nets into the Galilee or the Galil or into the Mediterranean Sea and pull out fish. When you don't have the money to go and buy or work and do. And you cannot have food except that, that with which you had salted your meat to preserve in times of leanness, to preserve in times of famine. To have that jerky, as it were, or that salted fish that is preserved because without a refrigerator, which they did not have, without any means of preserving the food, you had to catch and eat or else salt it for meat. And if you didn't do that, you didn't have it because it didn't last. Not in a hot, desert, high climate with which even Jerusalem and the Galil, no matter where you go in Israel today, it's hot and it's warm. And it will not last, those things that you catch in one day can putrefy the next. So the reality of salt was very important to every single person living and alive in that day, even as we just use it as a flavoring today. So let's be real. What are you good for? Are you that good for preserving food so that people can look at your life and taste and see that the Lord is good? And they savor the experiences you had. They listen to the words you speak. They know with where you come from and what you are sharing with them. Or are they trotting you underfoot because they want nothing to do with what you have to say? They're not interested because you're good for nothing. What are you if you're not the salt of the earth? Just extra salt. Are you rather like those men and women who take a little salt and then decide to scoop up shovels of it and dump it on people. You know, hey, you want some salt? Let me give you a cup of salt. Let me give you two cups of salt. Let me pour into you 
enough salt to make brine so that when you swallow any water, your throat constricts and you vomit out the very fluids with which should have given you life. Is that the kind of salt you are? Too much? Too much saltiness and not the salt of the earth? What kind of salt are you? Are you being savored or cast out? Are you a flavoring or are you rather a brine? Are you that with which causes and preserves food in due season or are you that which pollutes and corrupts the living water? the waters and wells of salvation. What are you? What are you good for? What are you doing? What have you become? In Bible read, I can only read it and think and consider it and ponder it and make it real in my life. So as I read the word of God, as I ponder it, as I consider one last time, let's be real and sober-minded about these things we are speaking that Jesus said to the people, that Jesus says to you and he says to me. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under the foot of man. O oh God, my God, hear my cry, attend unto the prayer of my lips, consider the meditation of my heart, and let the joy of my spirit fly to you, so that God, I might give unto these thy servants, thy people, words of encouragement, that they be not trodden under foot of man, that they be not cast out, that they be not unsavory, but rather you make them into being the salt of the earth and causing them to grow up into the stature that with which you want them to be, which is that savoring, flavoring, preserving capability that they should be, that they could be if they just allow themselves to be what your word has declared, that they are the salt of the earth. They need to keep their savor. They need to be that flavor. They need to be with Jesus. Because Jesus, you said that you would be literally the salt and the light, that you are that preser preservation of us, that you have caused us to be saved from the world. So God, I pray that even as you were salt, let us be like you. Let us be someone that we could taste and see that you were good. And then likewise, people could see that we likewise have become unto you the same as the nature with which you had when you were here. Oh God, we don't want to be cast out. Oh God, we don't want to be unsavory. Oh God, we don't want to be trodden underfoot. Rather, oh God, make us the salt of the earth.